Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I am most certainly Alex. You are most certainly Alex. We know that you have the paperwork and everything, don't you? Yes. Do you want to go on an adventure with me? Possibly. Depends where we go, but sure, we'll, we'll say yes. Oh, well, you know what? We might have a, a good place that we can go. Uh, good news. We have Daniel McDonald with us back on the show. Tell us about an adventure we might be able to go on. Daniel, thank you for coming back on. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, uh, it's been a little while. How long has it been, Nathan? I think it's been it's been a year and a half or two or so. A little. I, I checked. It's 2016. Summer of 2016 it was. Okay, so it's over. So, yeah, okay. Yeah, long time. <laughs> it's been a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so how have you been, sir? I'm not too bad. Been, uh, keeping busy. Yeah, yeah keeping, keeping very busy. Yes, I can tell uh, with uh, Deep Dark Designs, uh, and I'm going to guess that what we're talking about today is probably what's been keeping you so busy. One of the things, there's been lots of other little things along the way, but this is the, uh, the biggest and the most recent for sure. Okay, excellent. Uh, so we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, something you have it coming to Kickstarter very soon, mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, called uh, Thunder of the Thorn. And um, th this sounds very ambitious, the way that you presented it to me. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. Yeah, that's uh, the intention. Okay. There's a lot going into it for sure. Tell me a little bit about what the, the setting for Thunder of the Thorn is. Just a little bit of information just at the, at the start of what it is. So one of the big conceits of the adventure is that we didn't want to make something that was com a complete setting, the kind of s sort of tram trampled rush all over your world. So what we did was we shrunk things down, and we've got the ragweed tumble is, is our location. We've got one Ooh. forest in which we set the adventure. We don't make any assumptions about your larger world, but within that, we lay out everything. So we've got locations, settlements, towns. It's kind of a mini contained setting that you can dump into any any kind of fantasy world you might be playing, seeing a campaign within. What is that place like? What, what does that look like? So it's it used to be, once upon a time, a very traditional high fantasy forest. So nothing particularly um, unusual about it, just deep, ancient, old, what you'd expect. Full of uh, living trees, I assume. Uh, it was at one point, yeah. And then uh, a little over a century ago, um, something changed which caused all the living trees actually to leave. So they all picked up and, and, and shot off somewhere else. Um, at the same time, the, the jungle or the forest kind of became more like a jungle. You got pernicious overgrowth coming in. You got these huge vine-like creepers just coming up from the forest floor, erupting everywhere and sort of taking over, something which nobody within the context of the adventure at that point was able to figure out why or what caused this. But at that point, it, the, the, the forest really changed. It became something else entirely. Yeah, uh, you had given me a little bit of the artwork for it as well. And mm -hmm. so uh, so I, I saw, the first thing I opened up was uh, for a mulchy. When, when I'm looking at something like a mulchy, what is the, the story behind some of these creatures? So the NPC, the character you're referring to, is, is, was at one point a traditional goblin. Mm. But what's happened is something lately um, has started to affect the forest. So. I mentioned earlier on that about 100 years ago, there was this big catalyst, this big changing event. And then mm. everything since then has been pretty much stable. The forest hasn't continued to grow. The ragweed tumble hasn't continued to expand until shortly before the adventure. And then mm. something's really shifted again for the first time in over a century, where the characters and creatures of the forest are starting to change mentally at first. So their, their behavior is becoming very unusually, uh, very unusual, very kind of perverted by a sense of almost organic growth, a, a draw to plant-like influences. And that, as the adventure continues, goes a little bit further with certain characters and becomes a physical transformation. And that's what oh, you're okay. seeing with characters like that, where they start to gain these plant-like qualities um, and have things like mushrooms springing from them. It sounds like a fey radiated this forest with fey energy to me mm -hmm. it's like chernobyl except the spirit of a fey instead of a <laughs> nuclear reactor that's very possible 
<laughs> yeah, it it sounds uh it sounds a little bit like uh in The Last of Us when the spores get on people and then mm. they start growing the spores. Yeah, yep. it, it, it yeah, has yep. that kind of thing. And suddenly orcs. And suddenly orcs, yeah. <laughs> oh my an orc as a clicker, that is just terrifying for me now. I don't know if I, I want to go there. Is it gonna be okay for me if I go there, or am I probably going to die in this forest? Probably more the latter than the former. <laughs> One of the bigger components of the adventure is that rather than just leaving those kind of mental machinations and, and physical corruptions and those things at the uh, door of the NPCs and the creatures of the forest, yeah, as players, unless the GM rewrites things a little bit and adjusts things, you're, you're not immune to what's going on. Right. Uh, so uh, before we get into some of the, the details about the, the world, because there are some interesting things I want to touch on here. Um, mm -hmm. What was uh, what was your inspiration behind this setting? Like, what was the genesis that that got you to uh, Thunder of the Thorn as a as a setting? Um, so uh, a couple of years ago now, probably about two years ago, we were working on um, some other adventures. And I wanted to start expanding on what we were doing there by bringing in more player options, more GM level stuff like new monsters, new NPC galleries, those kind of materials. Mm. And so I started working on something like um, a monster codex, if you're familiar with, with uh, the Pathfinder monster codex. Okay. Um, uh, which is Alex like... probably is, yeah. More than, okay. more than me, but yeah. <laughs> but I am I'm so, a little bit familiar. Yeah. So what they did there was they took about a dozen classifications of really classic monsters, so like goblins, orcs, um, bugbears. And instead of doing a, a 300-page beastry, they picked out just 12 or 18 or so and did a real deep dive into those ones, adding more stat blocks, more magic items, feats, class options, really fleshing them out. And I thought, well, I would like to do something more like that with a goblin book. Mm. And then I decided as it evolved to tie into it a, an adventure as a primer. And then I ended up separating the two things off. So the, the goblin book is something else that we'll be doing further down the line as, as, a, as actually a smaller project, because I realized that the adventure um, was kind of growing and, and becoming a, a thing all to itself that was much more interesting mm. um, to be given its own way. Instead of sort of mashing the two things together, it was a case of stepping back, separating them off and making them what they really wanted to be. Because um, we, the original concept of Thunder of Thorn was a much, much shorter, smaller adventure. It was much more straightforward. Mm. And then we were like, hang on, we could, we could actually separate this off and make this its own thing. A lot of what the other book was going to be was just a deep dive into goblins, whereas actually sure. here, there's a, a litany of things that we do for the specific for the adventure with regards to NPCs. And then we want to dive more into the, the plant corruptions, the physical corruptions, all the mutant, mutated kind of unusual adventure specific stuff that actually mm. wouldn't have had as much versatility for reusability elsewhere. So it was right. like, okay, if we... If we bring that into here, then we're shortchanging what a GM might want elsewhere. Mm. So we separated them off. And now what we've got is, is um, quite a substantial appendices here with NPCs for this adventure, stat blocks this adventure. We've actually got coming up in the appendices um, some templates and stuff. So if you wanted to make some of the corrupted mutants and apply them to other stat blocks, other creatures, whatever, right. you could take that beyond this adventure as well. Oh, okay, excellent. So basically, what what I'm getting out of that is that uh, there are some things that are in Thunder of the Thorn that might not ne necessarily translate as well uh, if you were m using them outside of the setting. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, a big big part of that is um, I mentioned already. We've got physical corruptions, um, and we've yeah. also got our physical mutations and mental corruptions. We've yeah. seen lots of books and lots of adventures as well that have done, um, say, madness rules or insanity rules. Uh, a good example of that from Wizards of the Coast would be Out of the Abyss, where they added in um, madness charts for every one of their demon lords for eight or nine um, for eight or nine characters. So they had lots and lots of madnesses. But they were all very, very generic, very broad. Mm. They were great, but they were designed to be recycled and reused and that GMs could take them and run with them. Now, that's great, and that works for certain adventures and products. But the trade-off is that if you go much more specific, you can present a really unique, really one-of-a-kind adventure that's really true to itself. Mm. And that's what we do. So all of our madnesses, um, I don't know if you've had a chance to look through them, but they're very, very tied around the idea of creatures becoming more plant-like. So people are suddenly uh, drawn to photosynthesizing. They're drawn to, say, sowing their seeds. 
they're drawn to burying themselves in the ground. It's it's a very unique, very specific take on an idea that's you know maybe done more broadly elsewhere, and that's one right. of the big ways we set we set things apart. You say uh, the uh, the burying themselves in the ground, and all I can imagine is you coming across this garden looking thing in the forest of a bunch of humanoids that are just neck deep in the ground and you mm-hmm. your character leans in and goes why are they all buried in the soil and someone else leans in and goes they're fucking crazy <laughs> <laughs> yeah you just expect some of that for sure <laughs> that's perfect uh move now- along move along <laughs> <laughs> alex how excited are you by the idea of, of massive goblin customization I mean, I, I like customization of any kind. I actually had a similar idea before where you could totally take only, like, a dozen or two dozen creatures and just kind of broaden them and do variations of them, and there's yeah. no reason that shouldn't be able to be a thing. So I like that idea as well. But um, I know that you said you're going to do that later down the line, but I hope it, it turns out really interesting and the goblins uh, are represented in a, like, very wide breadth instead of just the well there's this one type of goblin yeah no, there'll be there'll be quite a few in the adventure one of the things we um we do as well as once we've presented a lot of individual stat blocks as we go through the adventure text room by room um a lot of the goblins then have further modifications and it's not just the goblins once once you get a little further adventure we get a chance to open up we want to revisit quite a few monsters you you probably have seen the cover which has got what's obviously a roper but a heavily mutated roper um, and that features quite late in the adventure. But one of the things about that creature, for example, is that its uh, its reach is sort of four or five times what you normally have with a roper. So it actually can attack you from several rooms away. So it's the initial exposure to it is a hazard where it, it could, you know, grab a couple of um, players or event or even monsters because we might we're still playing with that room and playtesting a little bit. But we might throw it at you mid encounter okay. and just have two hapless goblins get grabbed plucked and jerked at you know 50 or 60 foot around three sure. four corridors over <laughs> um so we're, we're trying to modify a lot of the a lot of the existing creatures as well bring back some of the classics and do really unusual mutated versions of them i would love to see a roper with um like telekinetic grip mm. and it can like see through the walls like it can sense you and then it can grab you like through a wall and then smash you through a wall. That's awesome. I'm stealing that. Like, <laughs> yeah, do it. I, I, if you do that, just just be like, here's this roper you were talking about. It basically can grab you from like 80 feet away telekinetically and then oh. smash you through six or seven dungeon walls to get to that's it. Yeah. Because oh. you would take a, it would be brutal. You would take a lot mm. of damage if it smashes you through the walls. Depending what the walls are made of, you you might have to figure that out. <laughs> I like the idea if it had a laser eye, that would be fun too. No, if they had... it's what? got a laser strap to its head. It's got a laser strap to its head. Yeah, if you can do a laser shark, you can do a laser roper. What if this is this is just a question I have personally? If you have a roper and it it is now basically it has the entire party in in its little ropey hands, right? What happens then? Is the whole party grappled? So we're still locking in that encounter. We've got a couple of versions of it they're playtesting at the moment. A normal D&D stat block just has, say, senses like, say, 60-foot dark vision. Right. But because the roper's reach is like 80 foot, we're revising mm-hmm. it so it doesn't need to see you. As long as it can reach, it can see where it can reach within, say, 5 or 10 foot of wherever it can reach with its tentacles. Sure. So then what we've done from there is we've kind of given the core roper a stat block, and then it's got health and survivability of each of the arms. So if it grapples you two or three rooms away, you can you can cut yourself free. You can sever the you know the tentacle and rip out of it. There's a creature at the core of the encounter, but then it, it's more of an environmental hazard that one. So it's mm. it's acting as for four or five creatures just for the simplicity of how the game runs, how the rules in the game operate. Right. But yeah, so far we've had a we've had a lot of fun playtesting that. Does the roper have disadvantage if it can't actually see you, for instance? There's two builds of it at the moment. One where it, it's it's got advantages once you're within its its line of sight, um, and the other one where it's kind of using like a form of tremor sense. It's quite when you get into the section where it is, there's some environmental rules come into effect um, that kind of link the rope to the environment around it. You've seen it's plant like, um, and we use something at the moment a little bit similar to how spiders in D and D can do like web sense, where they can kind of it's like a form of tremor sense that runs through the environment around them. So, for example, one of the versions that we've got 
was where you battle the Roper alongside um, some goblins. So you meet the goblins first, you run an encounter, X number of rounds in, the Roper grabs people at random. Maybe some, maybe some players, maybe some goblins. And in one version of that, it grabs people who are standing on uh, areas that are filled with um, difficult terrain. So if you're oh. standing in the vegetation, it can see that you're moving around, it can feel you, it can grab you blindly. But if you're standing out of the vegetation, then you're left alone. Because that's one of the two or three big battles of the whole adventure, that's one we're locking in still. Yeah, I was actually going to ask what if it had like a root network along the ground or the floor, for instance. So if, say you're standing on any part of its extensive root network that it has, you could be like, oh, it can tell exactly where you are. And it could be one of those really minor details that players won't necessarily pay attention to. But yeah. if they notice it, it's like, oh... I got this. We're standing on this thing's roots. It can tell where exactly. we are. So yeah. it could be one of those things that is, you don't pay much attention to it, but it can be really important if you do. There's a good example of that, actually, in the adventure. One of the things that um, we, we try to, as we go through it, reapproach how we conceptualize everything. And we always find that you've, with every dungeon, there's usually like a little chart of random wandering monsters that can stumble across you. Sure. And, um, one of the things in this is that we've got the same thing. There's, there's monsters you can stumble across as you go. And again, we use that to kind of randomize things. So you get different random mutations with different wandering parties, etc. But what's interesting about it is normally you just encounter them as you move forward. One of the mm -hmm. big components of this adventure is we play with, um, we play a lot with the escalation of madness and mutations as to whether or not you want to press ahead or fall back and retreat to rest because time is a really important recess, uh, important resource, sorry, when you're kind of unraveling at the seams as a character. But if you retreat back and you start running into wandering encounters, you're wasting a lot of time. But if you mm -hmm. retreat further ahead, you're exposing yourself to greater risks and you unravel faster the further you go. Mm -hmm. But one of the cool things that ties into what you've just said there is we didn't like the idea of just wandering monsters, just bang, roll a chart and they pop up. So as you're going through this kind of the more dungeon section later in the adventure, there's an area from which wandering monsters enter the dungeon. So it's actually a little way in. It's in the sort of, I think, the second or third floor from the top of my head, where it, there's a, a, a passageway that leads into the dungeon from further afield. But it means if you're in the first half of the dungeon, wandering monsters would come from ahead of you. If you get past that point, they'd come from behind you. But if you think about how you want to organize your rests and your party resting, which direction you want to face, where you want to dig in, if you notice that little detail that they always come from certain directions, it would give you, if I was GMing, certainly it would give you a, a significant advantage to know where threats are coming from. Sure. Um, the extent to which that's true is really going to depend on how much a GM wants to engage with that. But it's a nice little nugget knowing that. Yeah, yeah. No, I like the idea that a random encounter at least has some structure to it, and it doesn't just feel like it just comes out of nowhere. Um, yeah. That, that's always one of those things where, like, you know, if you if you just end up and it's like, oh, I guess we're just fighting some spiders now. Okay, I guess that's fine. <laughs> but if I actually have some context for it, I, I at least playing, I like that. It makes mm -hmm. it feel like it's it's still pertinent. One thing on the Roper, I just like the idea that I would just go into this entire room that's just full of greenery and then it's like, where do I step? Like, if I step in certain parts, it's like not where the Roper is. Like, it's not part of the network. And then, it, so then it basically becomes like uh, an Indiana Jones style, like Temple of Doom scenario where I have to step on the right bricks so that that's like a whole mini game in and of itself. <laughs> it's like... well, obviously, you don't step on the vines with the blood color to them, Nathan. M maybe, maybe it's a blood vine. I mean, it's it's probably full blood at this point. I've definitely seen arguments for and against random encounters over the last several years, where some people are like, "Oh, well, random encounters—they're not necessary. They don't really have a story purpose." Mm -hmm. But they can, and they can add a lot to your world as well. So where you've got this forest filled with corruption and madness, um, I definitely think the, the wandering monsters or random encounters can help make that feel like it's a living forest. Mm -hmm. right, right. Or maybe a dying forest, I don't know. I was always just a little confused by random encounters. Uh, not You're walking through the woods. Well, Suddenly there is a fox. 
That's a random encounter, Nathan. That's a, that's a random encounter. Well, no, You're I, driving through Crawford Notch and suddenly a bear hops in front of your car. That is a random encounter I've had. Yes, that is a real random encounter you've had. No, no, no. It's not that I don't understand what a random encounter <laughs> is. I just – I never really understood how you – like why do they get activated, that kind of thing. You know, like why think, why all of a sudden do I have a random encounter in front of me? I think it's funny with random encounters because – there's certain contexts where they really work and make sense the adventure. So like I find with a, say you're running a, um, they did Tomb of, a Tomb of Annihilation for D&D uh, the other year was one of the official adventures. And because it was a um, kind of a little bit more of a survival based adventure and a little bit of a hex grid crawl. Mm. If you're ever playing like, say you play the video game Resident Evil, one of the yeah. ways it operates is by having really limited resources, really limited bullets, really limited everything. But it makes you consider the weight of your actions. And I right. found, I, I ran to a violation for a, a, a group of my friends. And mm. one of the things I noticed was that random encounters are, are almost a waste of time, in my, in my opinion, to run as part of a travel section. Because what mm. you tend to get is they do them like once in an afternoon, once, once morning, once afternoon, say twice a day, whatever. But that's enough for you to approach every random encounter at full resources. So mm -hmm. you've got unless they're lethal, which you're not gonna you're not gonna throw random lethal encounters at people, especially you know it's a spectrum of level ranges. So right. like that one there, I think was level one to six, and you're not gonna have level one players doing a level six lethal encounter. So oh, I mean you could do, <laughs> but it's I mean, not gonna. You end say well, that, but... and then I I, I definitely <laughs> killed players with a random encounter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does happen. I've um I've come close a couple of times. But in order to make the enjoy it, because players, if they randomly die for no reason at all, out of the blue, through no fault of their own, it's it's going to be uh, an experience that only appeals to some people. So you don't want to be sure. too rural. You want to be reasonable. But mm. the problem is, if you're doing a reasonable fight as the right. only fight for that max resources, it's not a reasonable fight. It's a bit of a joke. So it doesn't really work out. How do you get a meaty, substantial, interesting encounter separated by a full heal? And that's a real challenge. It's why I prefer random encounters when you put them in the context of a dungeon where you are trying to figure out where to rest, how to dig in, where threats are coming from, where you can give it some thought and some application. Like in the case of Tomb Annihilation, one of the things I noticed was because they weren't that satisfying and the group got stronger and stronger and started to outpace them, I was like, oh, okay, I'll phase them out. But the problem mm -hmm. was that was a survival adventure. And the encounters, although they weren't particularly dangerous, were annoying. But, but that was integral mm. because that added weight to going in the dungeon. It's the same thing as like the older Resident Evil games working. Like the idea that the camera angles were awkward and you couldn't see what you were doing right. added and heightened the impact of the fear because you couldn't fight threats properly. You couldn't. You couldn't handle a larger inventory, but as a result, wasting time actually has a lot of value in survival because it makes you stop and consider what are the opportunity cost of decision is. Do we want to go into the jungle because we're going to waste three sessions trailing around? Yeah. And it does add to the experience. And we ended up folding them back in because everyone agreed they were obnoxious. And it really helped me out. <laughs> that These was are so that annoying. Was we need to have more of them. I don't really mind that because it, the idea of, uh, you know, this is going to be a safe path, but it's going to be longer and it's going to be a slog. Or you could just go fast and furious, try and get right to the, the point. You, you, the player has the option. You've given yeah. them that. The thing that, that I found interesting, though, in random encounters was this idea that they don't really have to be so random like they can mm. seem like a, they can seem like a random encounter we were playing and um we had gotten jumped by a band of uh i guess i i think it turned out they were bug bears what instruments did they play they didn't they, I don't think they played any instruments. You, you said it was a band. I was just assuming it was a mariachi. Oh, no, not a band of <laughs> bugbears. But boy, boy, a mariachi bugbear band would be amazing. Uh, no, they, no, they were uh, a band of thieves. They were highwaymen, oh. and, oh, okay. uh, and they, they, they were bugbears. And so we went and we engaged them, uh, but we, we had left one alive and we interrogated them. But what happened was uh, the way Dom had done that is that that bugbear actually then had 
some information that was working into kind of the larger overarching picture because we hadn't been up north and they would have been up there. So they would be more aware of the situation that we were going into. And so right. then that actually becomes a whole part of the story and information to the party that's that's bigger, that's larger. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not so much of just a, a random encounter that it's still all kind of can work into the story if, if you want it to. Uh, so, you know, you can make that work to your advantage as well. Yeah, yeah. It's like from a design perspective, as a designer, one of the big challenges is since I remember reading a little while ago, I think it was when around the time Curse of Strahd, the official adventure came out, they were going back to the origin of Barovia, the origin of Strahd as a character. And up until that point, a lot of the D&D adventures had always been room one a goblin, room two a vampire, room three a beholder, like just right. monsters thrown in at random. And they didn't like that. And that's where the idea came from, of putting in a vampire lord and explaining. I think that was actually it specifically, was that they just bumped into a vampire yeah. in a dungeon with no context. <laughs> and I think it was um, it was a case of like, well, why is this here? What's the story? What's the law? I think as the dying, that's the challenge. I don't, none of the random encounters that we would implement or have ever implemented have been truly random. Because I right. think you're doing a disservice to GMs if you... If they've got to do all of the work to figure out why this is here, what is its origin, how does it connect? Right. And that's something we've really tried to focus on throughout Thunder of the Thorn. So one of the things you, you might have seen the examples I've sent over mm -hmm. is we've got sections on random encounters, random events, um, the sections right. on locations, and then we've also got discoveries, we've got treasures. And later on, just past what you've got, uh, mm -hmm. as we get into the town settlement, We've got a section on quest primers and side quests. So what okay. we do is we try and interlink every interlink everything. So if you're a newer GM and you don't know how to like, you know, you've got this 128 page book in front of you and you want to make it all sing and dance together and connect and you're not sure how to do it, then we've failed somewhere along the way. It mm. should feel conspiratorial as a GM, like players like, oh, did you connect everything together? And you sort of tap your nose and go, of course I did. Right. And we try and bake that into what we do. So you'll see um, if there's a location, and in fact, there's a good example of this, one of the magic items you can get in the adventure is being warned by an NPC who's quite hostile and is wandering around the forest. So he features as an event. You can meet him, but you can also follow him back to his location, his home base, which is in locations. Now, some people have got some questions about him, which will also feature in the, in the quest primers and side quest sections. So everything's designed to not require you to read all of those sections at once but if you pick things out you might meet them in one context or another or learn about different things that are all connected themes that after the fact as a gm you can go aha that random encounter does have a location and someone is curious about it and right. people are talking and it suddenly starts to sit together one of the components of that i, I just mentioned side quests and quest primers a lot of people probably wouldn't necessarily know what those two things are because it's something we've done here that isn't really done necessarily by those terms before. Mm. Um, so what we've done is when we get a little bit further in the adventure uh, into the specifically the settlement of Rekers Hollow, we've got a section there on side quests where we present some, you know, sort of reasonably fleshed out quests, a beginning, a middle and end, a quest giver, what they want done, how they want it done, who the adversaries are, what would be involved in completing that quest as a defined quest. But then also we flip over and we have these little quest primers where there are four GMs who want to create more content while using a, a published venture. And what they are instead is they're much shorter and they're great little ideas of here's a great character or here's a great location, here's a problem that could be affecting it, you go and do the work. So okay. it's a much smaller section, but it doesn't come with stat blocks, it doesn't come with locations, because you could decide where that location is in the forest. We've got rules for traversing right. the forest and, and journeying around, so you've got specific quests from us that are really fleshed out, really involved. They're really great. It's a longer section that you can just use. And there's more than enough of them to get you the XP you would require to move forward and continue the adventures. You don't have to design anything yourself at all. But okay. then you've got these short, tight little primers you can pull out and do what you want with. And, but again, then, if you've got a great NPC that you like, there's no reason you couldn't then go away and design more around that. You've probably sure. got a location. You've probably got other materials to use. So you can kind of do more what you want with it, but we've got that basic, those building blocks in place for you to run with. 
I see. I see. Yeah, because when I think about like um, when you were saying like uh, main quest, side quest, I thought like, mm-hmm. you know, that thing in like a video game when you go up to the mission board and they'll be like, yes. here's here's your side yeah. quests. And you just you you accept them. And so, and mm-hmm. I'm like, I don't know if that would work the way. <laughs> I don't know exactly. All the side works. quests, no main quests, just side quests, nothing else. When Story doesn't get, progress. When they give you six side quests that you can accept, I just accept them all. I don't know if I'm going to get to them, or not, but it's like I don't want to come back to the mission board. <laughs> So I want to just get that. But when can you tie in the side quests to the main quests? Like perhaps some side quests you're doing and some person you find actually relates back to the main quests that you're working on? Yeah, very much so, yeah. It shouldn't be so it, it depends whether or not GM wants to just use the quests we've prepared or evolve their own things tangentially to that. But one of the things we allowed for pretty early on was you can kind of just wander up. You can get sort of a little bit lost in the woods and wander up to locations from later on out of order with no real context. So uh, one of the things about the adventure is after you've done some sites and various quests, bits and bobs in town, there's like an escalation event where something happens. You arrive back in the wake of it back in town, assuming you've left, which you might not have, and you're given a quest. But if you were to preemptively go to the location that triggered that, instead of arriving in the wake of it and everyone's thrusting it on you, you are the ones turning up going, hi, this has happened. So there's there's a fairly large opportunity to do things a little bit out of order. So, for example, one of the things you could do is is there's a um, we have Florina, who's the queen of the Fae, who's uh, most people haven't dealt with Florina. There's a lot of um, legends and lore tied into the setting around her. So a lot of the raggers, the people of Raggers Hollow, will say, um, you know, don't spread gossip. Florina's always listening. Um, and that's one of the things is they, they believe that if you uh, act in a disreputable way, you might get summoned to Florina's court somewhere in the forest. And it's entirely possible to go and meet Florina, her to acknowledge that something's gone awry, and to be the main quest giver who asks you guys to go and investigate. But the adventure doesn't assume that at all. She shouldn't necessarily feature. We've just got information about her, about her agents, about her court. Sure. And then there's no reason at all if a GM, say you were playing with six druids, and that was your whole shtick, was right. the you know the, the disruption to the natural order of things and how the Fae might interact with, with, with what's going on. Or if you're a warlock with, say, a Fae patron, that might really appeal to you. Well, as a GM, you've got the tools then to go, well, actually, don't worry about anything in town any of the, the assumed quest givers skip all that. It's not relevant. Sure. Um, but that's what happens. You know, the adventure, it's a level one to five adventure, but we're over 100 pages. We're looking at about 128 pages, maybe a little bit longer, um, depending on the stretch goals we hit. Because what we wanted to do was something a little bit grander, where we actually do have a larger forest that's got a lot more materials than you need to complete the adventure. And even, right. say, Raggers Hollow, the hub, if you really wanted to run it as a much more urban thing, you you conceivably could. There's 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 a lot of primers that relate to people in town. There's politicking going on there. Um, mm. Would I expect you to run through the whole lot without going into the wilds? I I doubt it. I, I think that's where things are geared up to lead. But a right. GM could modify it. There's enough characters there to build on that you could do. You could just look at that and go, I'll treat this as a as a location, I'll run it in town. I won't go into the forest. But what I will say is one thing we've done this time round is that Thunder of Thorns materials are more adventure specific. So what you so say the Raggers Raggers Hollow, the Ragweed Tumble, they're not presented as a setting and then an adventure's like the context from the adventure. They're all okay. presented together. So it's very, very specific. It's not something you just grab Rag, Raggers Hollow and the Ragweed Tumble and go, I'll just fold this into 50 other campaigns. You could do, but you'll require some modification. I like that you can possibly complete this, uh, one through five, complete this different ways. Whereas I feel like, don't quote me on it, but I feel like a lot of uh, dungeon crawl adventure type things in general don't have a lot of options that you can do. Or it's kind of railroady. There might be a thing here. You make a choice, yeah. but it feels like there's a lot more options to like replay this multiple times and never have quite the same outcome of how you got there. Definitely, that's a huge focus. The way we've kind of built the adventure is an adventure of two halves. 
So I've mentioned this kind of the mental depredations and the systems tied to that. And what happens is during the first half of the adventure, it's very, very open. You can go a lot of places, do a lot of things and progress in whatever way you want. And there's plenty of things to see and do there. As you're progressing through this, you're very slowly accruing the kind of the uh, the depredations of the forest, the debilitating effects. And then at a certain point, I'd say it flips when you really get into the dungeon crawl component, which depending on your group could actually be condensed down and run quite quickly as this, the much smaller part of the adventure, if that's what you wanted to do, or you could spend a lot more time on that because it's quite an unusual dungeon crawl. It's, it's not, the pacing and structure is very, very different. Once you get there, suddenly it's a little bit more linear but the speed of things unraveling as characters um, is, is huge. So what we've tried to do is something like really big and open and give you the tools as a GM to spend as long there as you want. So as you progress through the later stages, the effects of the, the mental and physical escalations um, happen much, much, much more quickly. I think by the end, compared to just being in the forest versus being the final chambers of the dungeon, is like, dozens of times quicker so it really becomes a problem so the more you start to push ahead the more the more you're forced to push ahead but until you take that step then you can as a gm you can encourage people to go as slowly as they want to and spend as long in the forest as they might as they might want to as a group so here's a quick question and an idea for you Mm -hmm. is it possible to have a party that starts in the dungeon with say a certain level of madness and or mutations already going on and they have to crawl their way out of the dungeon and then affect the uh, forest. So uh, do you mean starting in the depths of the dungeon and working backwards out? Yeah, so the, you, you basically you'd flip the story around backwards where something's in the dungeon and it's the, like maybe a party that failed to do a thing, so they're dead or corrupted or whatever. And they come out of the dungeon and start spreading corruption, perhaps. It's... Possible, actually, the part of corruption could work as well. But the idea specifically of starting in kind of the with a maybe with or without a mild amount of corruption and madness, but starting in the worst possible point and racing out of that is actually a very, very cool idea. You could modify it as a GM, but because you've got specific bosses and villains that you want to overcome, mm-hmm. it's not something we would present as the core option in the book. But actually, I do like that twist the idea of starting in the worst affected area and racing out. Is quite nice. What I think is quite nice if you're if you're going through it as a player is that a lot of it creeps up on you. You know, there's no voice coming from the heavens to say, "Hey, if you rest on level three versus level two, then you're likely to unravel a little bit quicker because you're nearer to the the you know the the thing that's causing all of the problems." Um, so I do expect to be a certain amount of players kind of messing things up as they go through, and it's a little bit forgiving for that. But you're probably going to make increasingly better decisions in hindsight um one example of that um where i mentioned we want to reapproach how we did the dungeon is the the forest itself i mentioned had these huge um like briar thorn kind of like beanstalk protrusions coming through it when you get into our dungeon and you go through the the four levels of it the levels where the grids are kind of overlap so you can actually see the same uh briar thorns coming up through each floor as you go down and what we've done is we've created um, one threat there who's sort of breaks out of the room by room, chain by, ch- by chamber um, approach of most dungeons, who kind of skips all of that. So there's a dryad down there who's been driven insane, completely bonkers. She's become this black widow who's picking off um, the creatures, the people, anyone who goes down there. If she can get them alone, she goes after them and, and attempts to drag them away and kill them. One of the consequences of that, though, is dryads can move in D&D through trees. They can use tree warp. And as you're going deeper and deeper, the trees are getting larger and larger. Now, her focus is drag- isn't is just slitting your throat and immediately killing you. It's dragging you away and trying to get you away from a group and kill you and, and bump you off. But what it means is there's an omnipresent threat who can ju- appear at any time. She's like the GM's little cheat card. She can just walk out of a, gro- a vine growth on any floor at any point. And as you get deeper and they get bigger, they, the growth start to get closer together. So the ability of her to get in the way of things and cause problems grows. But of course, if you're playing through it plainly, you're not going to know that there's a threat who'll emerge in the dead of night when you've got one person on watch. You're not going to know which direction threats are coming from. What There's so many components to it. And one of them, for example, I said the monsters have different mutations, would be that 
certain monsters here might have resistances to, say, um, magic damage or sure. range damage, but certain depredations and corruptions might reduce your speed. So if you're the barbarian who runs in and you're battling creatures that are quite contagious, so you don't want to be necessarily in physical physical striking distance or your movement's been reduced substantially, mm. well, suddenly you've changed completely how you play your character because your normal route isn't viable. Mm. But that's also changing a little bit room by room based on the monsters, and a lot of that's tied into physical descriptions. The extent to which a GM engages with that is down to the GM. If a GM isn't going to give you a description or you're not going to ask, then you're not going to know one monster looks different to another. But if a GM engages with that, and you can see that this creature is really clearly contagious, um, or that they've got like a super-sized limb, so they've probably got huge reach, then you can adjust your strategy on the fly, and you will be rewarded for that. Um, if you're not doing that at all, then you are putting yourself at disadvantage for not engaging your brain and thinking through the encounters as they occur. And uh, I would certainly hope if, if they're picking up Thunder of the Thorn, they would want to utilize all the things that you've put into it because there's just such interesting stuff in there, which actually leads me to to talking about the, uh, the, the mania and the madness and the corruption because we've talked a little bit about it, but I, I figure that by the time I'm done, my character will be completely insane, but I'm trying to figure out how, how do I end up getting mania? What happens with corruption? How does my character end up getting those sort of statuses and what does it mean? So let's take them one at a time. So let's go with the, sure. the mental corruptions first. Mm -hmm. So when you're out and about in the rugby tumble, initially it's very, very slow. Like I said, we want GMs and players not to feel rushed or raced. So you've got plenty of time at the beginning. So when you're in Ragus Hollow, the settlement, there's a, an earthquake that's preceded the adventure. And that's one of the big reasons the players are summoned there, because they've suddenly found these caverns and caves below the town. Okay. Because of that, there's this opening into the ground below. And that's one of the key areas where these, the mental machinations like resonating out from. So when you're in Ragus Hollow, each day the players spend there, they're going to make a check, uh, a D20 check, to see if they develop a, a mental corruption. If they're in Ragus Hollow, they have disadvantage in that, so they roll twice and take the lower. The rest of the tumble, they just roll once. And the idea is there's lots of mental machinations you can develop, these, these quirks, these foibles. And what you'll do is if you get a 2 to 20, nothing happens. Until you get a 1, then you gain a random mental machination, and then you continue about your day, you carry on as normal. If you roll the same number again, you roll one again, that mental machination escalates. If mm. you roll a two, you acquire a new one. And if you roll three to 20, you're fine until you have two and so on and so forth. Mm. So you're slowly accumulating different madnesses. So for example, because it's based around like a lot of plant things, one of them initially you might be mildly preoccupied with checking your water cantina. Have you got enough to satiate your thirst? And that's it. Then you might feel increasingly thirsty. Eventually, you might find that you don't want to get out. You want to find a body of water and sit in there all day. So it gets harder and harder to tear yourself away from them. Now, what we do is we treat that as a more of a role-playing motivation. So if you want to use inspiration and rewards as a GM, if you want to engage with that, you can. But we don't force that on players. We're not saying that you will suffer a penalty for not engaging with it. We hmm. do say, here's a simple rule as a GM. If a player is overtly ignoring a strong motivation, so sure. if they've reached an escalated to the point where their character is so obsessed with water and hydration, they don't want to not sit in water all day, and you deviate right. from that, you contradict that, you go and sit by a fireplace or dry yourself off, well, that's, that could require a check. And we've got some rules in place for that that you could lean on, but we're hmm. not saying you should do that. It's something if you want to engage with that and go ham on it, it's a lot of fun. But we know some groups don't. They want to play an adventure and they don't want to be pushing their characters' motivations and role play a thousand different directions at once. What we then do is as you go dive deeper and deeper, those checks go from being once a day to, I, I, off the top of my head, I think it's, it goes down to sort of like eight hours, four hours, an mm. hour. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's an hour with disadvantage later on. Mm -hmm. That's it, sorry. The first check is in the forest is with advantage. The Ragus Hollow is without advantage. But by the end, it's with disadvantage. So you get to this point where you're not checking now once a day and favorably, you're checking once an hour. 
So if you didn't realize that, you've descended so far, you know, let's take a, a long rest here. Well, that's eight checks of disadvantage per person. And that's why it escalates and unravels so, so, so quickly at the end of the adventure. Because say you've got a couple of madnesses at that point, it's not a one in 20 shot anymore. Say you've got four madnesses, you need a five to 20 to not escalate. Mm -hmm. So your characters unravel very, very, very slowly at the outset. In fact, there's a good chance that only one or two people <clears throat> will have even accumulated any kind of, you know, mental aberration mm -hmm. by the time they get underground. Right. But once it begins, it's very, very rapid. Mm. And that's one of the trade-offs then of, do we want to push forward and, and either push forward or rest here? Uh, but then if we're doing so, we're fighting for reduced resources. So it's going back, like I said, that I don't like, this isn't an adventure like... Um, where we want to shoehorn lots of random encounters and waste time. Like, like I said about right. the example of two annihilation, this isn't that kind of survivalist adventure. The equation here is what are we, what's the best decision minute to minute? If we go forward with half resources, then we could get beaten up. If we stop and rest right here, we could unravel rapidly. And if a GM is deciding to enforce those checks and you've got, say, half the party, say you're light averse, you don't want to sit by a campfire, because fire is bad and you're plant like, but you also know there's a dryad who wants to slit your throat if you sit away from the campfire. Do you sit with your friends? Do you go back? What do you do? Because right. you need to make a quick decision. Um, and if you retreat back, well, you could run into wandering monsters and find out you get you get healed, yes, but you also waste time, get beat up, and have to rest again. So right. our use of time as a resource and choosing to push forward and backwards is basically the whole crux of the adventure. It's the thing that we do that you won't find elsewhere, for better or worse. Some people right. won't like that. Um, yeah. And that's fine. We, we're not making an adventure that everyone will like, but it's unusual and it's true to itself. Right, right. I, I do find that that kind of uh, risk-reward uh, idea really does give the players something to think about. It's not just the idea of, uh, I'm just going to rest now so that I can regain all of my spell my my spell points <laughs> so that I can get all my key points back because I'm usually playing a monk. So let's get my key points back so that I'm good. Yeah. Uh, it's also like, uh, well, you know, there's also, you know, a give and take to that kind of going back to the resident evil, like you were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. you know, you know, well, I could try killing all these zombies, but, uh, I only have like six bullets. So, uh, <laughs> when is that, is that going to be a valuable uh, thing? Um, yeah. what, uh, what what happens like because I know this is going to happen to me. What happens when I end up with like twenty madnesses? Like I've rolled all the way up to like twenty, and then I I hit my twenty, and I guess I get a critical win by getting a twentieth uh, madness of some kind. Like what what happens by that point? Do I have any control over my character actually, <laughs> or does it just kind of <laughs> become a ball of crazy? I think there's 12 madnesses in total, so there isn't a full oh, okay. 20 to accumulate. But okay. they each go through stages and phases of, of kind of escalation as you go. We don't recommend that the GM seizes the player. I know like, if you play World of, World of Darkness, for example, there are conditions to which you lose control of your character. It's the same with New Warhammer. There's a lot of games that do that. Um, it's not something we're necessarily a fan of because the group of people that we play with are perfectly capable of um, role-playing uh, the most extreme things you could ever throw at them. Sure. And we like to assume that players are competent rather than incompetent, <laughs> if that makes sense. Like there isn't a yeah. level at which the GM should grab it and go, no, no, you're not you're not qualified to to make terrible things <laughs> for your character. I need to do it. <laughs> and of of course, the great thing about role playing game is it's only as um it's only the version of the game that it is at your table. So if a GM wants to do that, they can and will. In fact one of the one of the big things is that once you start getting further underground these initial kind of psychic mental machinations that are affecting people's mental state start to corrupt a lot of the other characters and creatures down there, turning them into plants, so going from just the mental side of it to much more physical. Mm. Now, we haven't extended that to players because the time you're going to spend under there, we've kind of thought of it as the people in the forest who are assumed to live there and the creatures have been exposed to a low level of this, um, this kind of influence for a very long time. They're primed by this point for a physical transformation by the time they start getting, going underground and getting exposed to it close up. The players mm. haven't. It's very rapid onset with the players. You arrive, 
And even if you spend a couple of weeks there, it's not like you've been there for a year or two dealing with this like others have. So you're, you, we don't propose that you start changing the players into living plants, which is what's going on with certainly some people. However, if a GM wanted to, you get 20 madnesses, well, that's the next logical step. If you wanted to do that, you could do all kinds of things. <laughs> but it's not necessary for the adventure. It adds a lot of, a lot of space, uh, page space for something that we don't think is, the, is something that actually makes sense for the context of the adventure by default to present as an option. However... Right that's mm. where the physical corruptions come in one of the keys to this adventure um which starts to get into spoiler territory so i won't go too far down that road sure is is the physical component which is not the same as what's causing the mental one the mental transformations it's mm. an actual contagion of a kind and so as much as you're just being exposed to these telekinetic these psychic machinations that corrupt you mentally bring you in line with what's going on Behind the scenes, there is a corruption that's causing things. And if you get exposed to that, you can accumulate it. You can become affected in the same ways. Yeah. And that's, that's where we make this distinction between what we think is interesting and fun that we think GMs and players might want and what we think is necessary for the balancing of the adventure. So when we talk about the mental side of things, those, 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 those mental effects, they're something that some players and GMs will love and they'll be their favorite part of the adventure bar none. And some won't like that at all because it's, mm. it's affecting role play and it's so thematic. It's not really tied to balancing. They just want to stomp through a dungeon. Sure. We treat that first system as basically optional because it's just, it's primarily role play. And if you mm. want to take it further and use the guidelines we've given you for balancing it, well, that's up to you, but we're not suggesting you even do that. We're just giving you a quick template for how you would because it shouldn't and doesn't need to affect the balancing. When you get onto the physical corruptions, that's purely mechanical. That's gotcha. where you get start getting physical impediments, movement adjustments. You get um, you get limitations on, like for example, forgetting spells or getting haphazard with your memory for concentration. Sure. Um, you get certain characters being pu pushed into behaving. One of the examples is you get this kind of growth like a sword, like lance growth emerging from your torso, going kind of diagonally through you. But it starts to mean that you have disadvantage and problems and challenges moving through the undergrowth. You can mm. no longer squeeze because you're suddenly treated like you're a, a size larger than you are. Right. But that creates all kinds of problems if you're trying to, either if you're a halfling who's brought yourself a, a mountain with you, which you could do in a dungeon, sure. Well, you can't ride it anymore because D&D's rules limit, require the mount to be a size smaller than you, for example. Well, now you're treated as a size larger. You're too unwieldy to ride it. And if that was your stick, you rode it in combat, you've got feats built around that, well, that becomes a problem. That's one example. There's lots of them. We like playing with role play. We like giving you role play incentives. It's like really unique and really unusual. But we know there's lots of people who just want a dungeon bash, and they want it primarily <laughs> to be that. So right. we separate them off in the two systems. The ideas behind corruption and the ideas behind madness, while they do have an actual gameplay element, they are also feel very character driven. You know, those those ideas really feel like they they lend themselves to a much bigger character arc, but you can also implement them as a dungeon crawler. So you can kind of do it however you you'd want to, but you've given people the tools so that they can figure out how they want to implement all of it. Definitely on the the mental corruptions, uh, the mental um, manifestation side, yeah. on the physical corruptions, because they're much more um you, you certainly would fold them into role player. I certainly would, as a role player, fold that in. But they're much more mechanical. So mm -hmm. we balance for them. So that means, right. say you get one which reduces your movement speed, you know, on, on several stages of whatever of escalation to that, if you disable everything about them, well, the adventure is going to be very easy. Because yeah. that's it's balanced around the assumption, and that's where the mechanics of those come in, that we've got. We've got a spectrum of the likelihood of you of you of gaining corruptions, um, and we balance and playtest around that. Okay. So it's assumed that you will have some impediments split over the group. Um, sure. But the first system, the mental systems, is as engaged as you want to engage with it. I see. Okay. Now, could I have manias or corruptions that might actually be beneficial to me in the end? Like you were talking about the uh, kind of like the spear almost that goes through me. But it, then if I like do like a, a shoulder ram, could I could I do piercing damage with that spear that's coming out of me? I'll have to get back on you on that. Okay. Uh, back to you on that. Because 
actually we did design a couple that were beneficial at beneficial at certain stages but we designed a lot and then obviously like you do you shortlist and you edit and yeah. i can't remember if they've made it to the final cut or not okay but there were there was one where it was like you developed this growth that was incredibly heavy and dense and yeah. that came with certain benefits you could be pushed around as easily um right. and it increased falling damage i think um but there's another one that reduced falling damage because it was the, the antonym of that or something along those lines there was a lot of versions that we played with but i'm not right. sure whether or not those beneficial ones have made it in what okay. i will say is something that's beneficial at one stage as it evolves probably come, comes with caveats the ones we had there right. might be one perk in it early on but by the time it had run its course yeah we we then balanced that um we accounted for that where the final consequence could be even more significant. Right, right. Because I was I was thinking since we were talking a little bit about the idea of risk reward and all of that, the idea that something that might have some negative consequences also might have some unintended benefits to it. Maybe I'm uh, photosensitive. While that might be really bad when I'm in high light environments, it might also benefit me when I'm in low light environments. Uh, exactly. So I kind of yeah. get, yeah, so that I, you know, maybe it's not a total waste or I can find a way to turn this new problem into into a potential benefit in the right circumstance. But what you're kind of saying is that by the end, really your your problem becomes greater than the advantage that you might have gotten. Yeah, as a general rule of thumb, for balancing reasons, they're 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 largely um if they're more forgiving early on, they're more likely to be harsher later on. But sure. the real thing, the real intention behind them is largely to force groups as you split these different advantages and disadvantages to force them to consider how they're approaching encounters and mix up their strategies. Sure. And we try and account for that. So one of them very specifically is called ablation. Um, I can't, I've got the book in front of me now, but I can't see any of the ones that give you specific advantages. Okay. But effectively with that one, um, you lose control of one of your limbs uh, and it escalates till you effectively, um, the, the, the limb is consumed by a growth altogether. So you don't have access to it anymore. Okay. And at phase one, that gives you disadvantage on dexterity or strength checks that use that limb. So if you're specifically using it as part right. of a check, like climbing, you'd have disadvantage. Mm. But as it goes up to phase two, that gives you disadvantage on attacks made with the affected limb. So if you're using two handed weapon, uh, two one-handed weapons, the second yeah. attack would have disadvantage. Right. It also affects weapons that have the two-handed property or have the versatile trait that you're using two-handed. So suddenly it changes how you behave. And then by the third stage of that one, you lose access to that limb completely. But that means that say okay. you're playing a barbarian who only carries a great axe and a couple of hand axes. Well, you're now down to hand axes from the great axe because yeah. your ability to make use of that great axe is certainly by the right. third stage gone. But even right. before that, it's it's so impaired that you with disadvantage in every attack, you might as well look around and go, hey, has anyone got a longsword? That's a D8 better than a D6. Can I just use a sword instead of my Because you're now... Right. I mean, if you're trying to min-max anyway, you're trying to think things through and, and come up with tactical solutions, you've got to deal with yeah. the fact your limb's gone. It's right. no longer serviceable. <laughs> right, So that's, right. That, that's a consideration that you wouldn't normally have to handle. Normally in D&D, uh, normally, but a lot of the time, certainly with a lot of the players, if you're min-maxing a little bit, you go, well, I like a longsword. I'm a longsword guy. So my destiny from level one to 20 is to get a plus one longsword, then a two, then a three. But it doesn't right. usually pivot you into going into great axes, into hammers, into the... You're not required yeah. to tailor your character to your situation. And we yeah. wanted to throw that in players a little bit and say, well, what would you do if you suddenly... Your character didn't play quite the way you thought they would? If you're a ranger, if you're an archer, you are screwed. <laughs> you are, I, yeah. don't, I don't really see. You're going to have to find some darts or something. Consequently, like, uh, like I have a monk, so I have a quarter staff, so it's a versatile weapon. So basically, what I'm getting is, even though my my hit dice isn't as great, if I got that kind of a corruption, I'd be better off trying to do it as a one handed weapon rather than a two handed weapon. Yeah, as a two hand, I think it goes up by one hit die, but you'd have disadvantage. So you'd be looking at yeah. losing one hand. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. As as a one handed weapon it's a it's a d6 and at a, t a two handed it's a d8 yeah so you know you get a little bit of a bump but if you're going to be getting disadvantaged by doing that it's not really worth it you're not going to be hitting nearly as as often mm -hmm. it does make me rethink how my character is going to work when you were uh developing thunder of the thorn and you were you were coming up with the the corruptions and all of this uh how much 
in your head was thinking about how different kinds of characters would interact differently with the world when they started to accrue these these issues. I think it was it was a major component for us where we knew we wanted to do something that would force you to, to really think about how you're approaching situation by situation. It actually it was something we we started a couple of years ago. It was the first product we ever worked on as a company. It's something we've never released to date actually. It was a, an adventure module that had you fighting clockwork automatons. And the whole theme of that was adding an entire beastry to the to the game that had these automatons with all these weird, unusual custom rules. So, for example, you'd have like a, a this thing rolling up to you, and it'd pulse each round, and you'd be like, "Does this thing explode? What's going on?" Right. And then some of them would be like service ones that could quickly repair fallen robots to repair others in real time. You'd take them out first. So they all had completely different rules that required you to understand them to battle them effectively. Look, a bit more like the Dark Souls mentality. If you knew what you were facing oh, yeah. and understood it, it would be three or four or five times easier. But we never got around to releasing that. We've actually still, it's something we play test from time to time and play around with internally. We always think of it as a white whale, the product that's never going to come out <laughs> <laughs> because it's been there since day one. And every right. year we commission some more art, we do a few bits and pieces. Yeah. But we did really want to play with that, that idea of understanding encounter by encounter what impediments you're facing and then changing how you play against against creatures who are doing the same. So a lot of the creatures in this thing will have different mutations. So they might have, you might find a group of enemies who do have resistance to magical damage. That means that's half magical damage across the board. Well, the problem is how many spells have you got per day to start burning them? And, and there's a lot of examples like that. One of them is, say for a barbarian, a barbarian focuses entirely on um, low AC, high HP, and especially effectively doubling its HP by taking half damage when it's raging. So it gets yeah. this huge stack of HP, low, low AC. Well, one of the corruptions, in a, a kind of a logical, sort of thematically explained way, increases your AC. It makes you harder to damage. I think it's because you're, um, you're more vulnerable areas. I, I'd have to okay. reread exactly why off the top of my head. But you right. increases your AC and reduces your hit die by one. But it means a barbarian stops playing to its strengths. Right. So there's lots of examples like that where, in, in the case you mentioned before about a ranger, well, okay, say you had two short swords in a ranger. Well, yeah. the ranger might be more practical in physical combat if you know that the, the physical corruptions are very, very dangerous and the barbarian's already got two or three because yeah. he was up front getting whomped. So yeah. suddenly you're like peeling back. Like we expect a group to want not to have any one person having all, as many corruptions as possible because they're going to debilitate that one character so heavily. So say you put your front uh, frontline fight and barbarian up front, they get a couple of corruptions each. Well, suddenly you're like, should we put the wizard up front? Does the Should the cleric mm. be sitting at the front of the pack? Because right. is it not better to risk getting one or two there than having all of the others escalate and advance and acquire more? So yeah. It's, it, it, yeah, that was a huge focus for us, was trying to find ways to make it so that people had to really think about how they were playing, how they were approaching, whether or not they were pushing forward, retreating, what the composition of their party should be. If right. you knew what you're doing going into the adventure, the first thing you do is go to the first town and buy as many weapons as possible right. to try and think <laughs> about, you know, yeah. going halfway to the dungeon and realize the consequence of going back. That said, it's like it's like all of role playing. One of the funny things mm -hmm. about when they, you know, when say Pathfinder, uh, Pezo, um, playtest Pathfinder Two is they need a sure. massive number of playtesters. When do you need to? They talk about the massive number of playtesters. Tabletop roleplay games are way harder to balance than any other format media you'll ever come across. Mm -hmm. And we've seen the easy encounter in the dungeon that's two levels below TPK group or vice versa. Yeah. So you're not trying to balance to perfection because you can't. One of the reasons fifth ed is, in my opinion, obviously, is so much more popular than fourth ed is because they got to a certain point in balancing and started breaking things because you don't want a role playing game that's perfectly balanced. It it does become a, a, a kind of counterproductive thing. We, we always argue that if you couldn't possibly die to an encounter, then it's rubbish. If you're always going <laughs> to die to an encounter, it's probably rubbish. Mm -hmm. It needs to be. When we play test, you have to really look at uh, is the group making good decisions? And are they being lucky or not? And are they optimized or not to really figure out a spectrum of performance? So it's it's definitely possible to play through Thunder of Thorn, ace every corruption check, ace every single mental machination check, and have nothing happen at all. Right. It could also be the case that your group falls apart at the seams. But what we've right. done is we've tried to balance it 
in those areas as well as we would as designers against just straight dying in any adventure. You shouldn't right. be throwing lethal encounter and easy encounter left, right, and center at a group because it's it's too boringly fun or it's too devastatingly hard. We've tried to build that into everything. But as a result, as, as I'm sure experiences will vary wildly, <laughs> as they do in every third party adventure, every official yeah. adventure, every right. everything. I'm gonna hear about people going, Oh, we didn't get any corruptions. Was that a system? My GM never mentioned it. And yeah. that's, that's yeah. never, it's always gonna happen. Yeah. Play again. You'll you'll get them. Don't worry. <laughs> one of, one of the times will. Yeah, yeah, have one more go. Now that actually, like as a player, that does make me uh think the question I'm inevitably gonna ask. Once I get manias or corruptions, can I get rid of them? Yes. The resolution of the adventure will give GMs a bit of a cop out, whereby um, the destruction of the thing that's causing the effects sort of releases a shockwave that removes the physical corruptions and okay. destroy and, and, and removes the mental corruptions as well. Okay. However, that's all for the players. Those who've undergone the physical transformation of a part plan. We just thought it was kind of funny to leave them that way. So, okay, good. <laughs> so, so the, the people who are um, who are developing stalk-like features and getting these elongated sprout-like heads and whatnot, and yeah. kind of odd plant-like fingers and hands and stuff, we've left that as is. Like that's that's fine. Gyms can do what they want there if they want to change things and rewrite things. I have to check exactly. It's a lot to keep in your head at once. Exactly how it functions. But there is one thing you can do in the short term is you can spend greater and lesser restoration spells to forestall the evolution of things. So again, I mentioned a lot of oh. this about resources. It works out quite perfectly. It's a one to five adventure. By the time you get the fifth level, you get restoration coming in, and it's when you'd really want to be unleashing your spells like mad to overcome the dungeon. But conversely, you could be using that, spending those spell slots to slow and forestall the progression of things to buy people in the party more time. So it's another thing where it's like, do you really want to burn your resources here or save them from there? And again, mm -hmm. that's that's another choice that certainly spellcasters will have. I, I can't think of specific examples, but there's certain corruptions in there that would be really horrific to certain classes. So right. if you're a ranger with a bow, having a movement impediment just isn't the same kind of problem as if a frontline melee fighter who needs to yeah. be highly agile. Mm -hmm. So if you get the worst corruptions... So you get two or three corruptions on the per the worst corruptions for the worst player, and he gets all of them. Then yeah, there's an argument yeah. for saying you should probably burn some spell slots to stop those things escalating. But yeah. in doing so, that's there's a consequence to that as well. No, that's a uh, that's interesting. It makes me wonder like what happens to some of those classes just from the the setting and the theme. I would usually think that druids would be like in a great position going into this. Like Alex, if if you had to play your druid. But uh, then it turned out that, like, all of your thorns were just uh, smiley face emojis. What would you do? I mean, I was a, f a feral druid, so yeah. that wouldn't really bother me much. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's fair enough. I'd be like, call lightning. I'm a bird now. Ha! Well, now that, that does bring me to a question, though, for you. Actually, Alex, let's go back to your druid for a minute. Just want to oh want to take it into this. Oh, geez. What would be the worst kind of corruption for your character? What would be what would be a big hindrance for for your character? I mean, he's a dragonborn lycanthrope druid. Okay, so nice. maybe if like there's no moon, that would be bad. <laughs> I don't think that's a corruption. <laughs> moon sense. It could be a corruption. I don't, I don't know. I'd have to look at the list of corruptions, Nathan. Okay. He's, he's already a feral animal. Yeah. So... He's, he's kind of corrupted. Oh, okay. So basically, uh, your, your GM, Running Thunder of the Thorn, uh, doesn't have to do anything. You've already done all the work for him. Not This is totally off like the point of this show exactly, but on that point, yeah. if we had continued that game, there was a possibility that that character was going to go feral. Oh, and that I would have taken uh, probably a few levels in Barbarian for Rage. Oh. Um, due to the other party member he had that he was leaning heavily on had left the party to do something else. Mm. Um, so Bo's character left, and my character had depended on him quite a bit. So, like, the fact of that person being gone would have made it, like, harder for him to, like, stay in check. Mm -hmm. So I was considering it very heavily of... Him just going feral and just being like really aggressive, not no holds barred, just like murdering all the things that we go up against. But that's fun. Like, 
It's like, I'm a were-tiger, and I'm a feral druid, and I'm just bloodthirsty now. Yeah. So that that was a thing that I had potentially uh, was going to do with that character for fun. Interesting. That's awesome. My turtle glows in the dark, so there's that. But that was a mutation I gave him from the beginning. So, And he's a ninja, so he's a giant glowing Aren't ninja. Aren't you all? Yeah. I know. I kind of like. I purposefully made a character that had a that that basically had a mutation that was not beneficial to his entire class. <laughs> so I thought that that was fun. Um, but you know, it does also make you think about uh, strategy. Like you know, if I'm supposed to be a stealthy character and I can't really be very stealthy, uh, how much does that take place, and and how does that affect me? In general, usually for me, it, it just means Rembrandt uh, just smacks things a lot um, <laughs> with his staff. It's, it's fun to think about characters playing against type. I really hope that the campaign goes well. Um, Thank you. Because I would love to hear uh, 50 different ways people have telling all these side quests and quests to get to this point. Mm. And I, I would love to um, hear back... Uh, maybe if some of our listeners get it, um, I would love to hear the different stories they have. Yeah. Um, yeah. From this, I think that would be really interesting to see how people played it differently mm-hmm. and how the corruptions and just the different ways you can do it uh, played out. And uh, and also, how many parties uh, halfway through were like, uh, "Screw it, we're leaving and coming back later," and just just run out of the dungeon. <laughs> because uh, I mean, I had a case of that just uh, a couple game sessions ago in the game I'm playing i was going on like a a little side quest with one of the other characters so there's just two of us these orphans were like my sister's sick my sister's sick and i'm like oh okay we'll go help your sister and we can check out this chest we got while we're at it and they like lead us down into some cellars this 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 little girl leads us down into some cellars it's it's starting to look kind of sketchy down there and she doesn't want any lights on or anything well, long story short, not an actual child. Uh, none of them. None of them were. They're, they're like we started seeing like other children that were around in in the cellar. Uh, so basically, uh, Dom had led us down into uh, basically a trap that we we ourselves put ourselves into. Yeah, no, they weren't. They weren't children. And when the like the illusion wore off, yeah, they were kind of like uh, monstrous, you know, creatures that had you know like sharp grimy claws on there and were basically luring people down into the cellars uh and so since there were just the two of us at that point and there were at least three running at us uh i basically like chucked the chest at the girl at the little girl i just like chucked the chest and i I used i used my minor illusion to just make like a giant boom sound because we had heard an explosion earlier so i made that sound to just throw everybody off and the two of us like ran out, shut the door behind us. Like they, they they were trying their illusion again to show like a little turtle child and a little halfling child because he's a halfling to try and give us sympathy. And uh, he's like, okay, and freezing the locks and, <laughs> and freezing the door, <laughs> and we're getting out of here. <laughs> and, and we jumped out. And what I immediately did is, um, because of the explosions and everything there were uh, guards in town that were going around and I immediately called them over and let them know about some really sketchy characters that were down in the cellar (laughs) and had this chest that looked like it was really incriminating, the one I threw (laughs) at them. And so they send their troops down and not all of them made it, but basically I just let them deal with it instead. And, And the leader, the captain of the guard comes back up and is like, did you... Did you know what the what those were? And I was like, well, you know, they I did say they looked really creepy. <laughs> like, I, did, <laughs> I did tell you that, but then you ran on down before I could really give you more information. And so, you know, then we went down to try and help the guards that were still alive and <laughs> just <laughs> help them back out of the room. <laughs> and so, so my creative problem solving when you're against the odds, run away, get help, and have them <laughs> deal with it instead. Um. It's quite funny to say that. Um, one of my preferred little, uh, from from D and Fifth Edition, they did a uh, Death House, which was okay. like the um, like the intro adventure to get you up to level th- uh, third level, I think it is. 
for um, Curse of Strahd. And they released it as like a standalone PDF. You can download it and run through it. It's a great little um, like gothic house themed um, little run. It's quite good for introducing the horror campaigns because it's a lot of, you know, wandering around the rooms, like studying the gothic features, a lot of implied horror earlier on. Then you've got picture art for the two characters, the two children who lead you in there, which are these really, really threatening looking gothic, all oddly proportioned vampire looking kids. And I've run, it must be four or five groups through it now. And every single group, they're like, oh, can we see the children? I'm like, show them the picture. And it's just immediately, nope, nope, we're not going in there. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Patiently evil. Not, <laughs> go, not going in there. Yeah, one, um, one look at what they look like. And it's like, no, no, no chance. No way. The funny thing is, is that um, I, I was trying to identify what these kids were. And when we started... Uh, because I, when, when when we started going down into the cellars and there were multiple rooms and she always wanted me to go through first, I started to think <laughs> to myself, uh, something feels wrong. She doesn't want me to put a torch on. Uh, all right. OK, something's something's weird here. Uh, our, our GM was like, uh, well, you, you, you can try and do some insight, but you're going to have disadvantage because what had happened earlier is another member of our group felt bad for the orphans and used some of her money to buy the kids new clothes so they were warm. Mm -hmm. And so uh -huh. now I get disadvantage on insight because now they're in clothes that I'm not familiar with. Right. So, in adv so inadvertently, it had now become like a whole thing. And now my conspiracy theory was that some these kids must have stolen this clo these clothing, and maybe that's why they're dead. Uh, so <laughs> there's like this, so there's like this whole roundabout thing where since our characters went off and did different things, it kind of ended up uh, screwing each other over a lot <laughs> later on. So that's why you don't split up the party. Your party will inadvertently ruin it for for everybody else <laughs> circling in on itself. But hey, you know, by the time we got the entire crew back together and we were, you know, detained in the in the in the station, our collective solution was to like set everything on fire, blast through a wall, and get the hell out of town. So maybe maybe that wasn't the best. Yeah, well, that's definitely a, a kind of theme of, of some of our groups. Is if you're going to split the party, you should only do it to sort of screw each other over. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's the best reason. What are your uh, goals and what are your tiers? You can just go over that briefly for me. Yeah, so we've got Thunder of Thorn itself. Um, you can get that digitally or physically as, as two separate tiers. The main two other tiers we've got is because we're, we kind of started out and went through a phase of releasing a few products, having some issues with Kickstarter coming off for a while and slowly going up from there. We haven't really had a chance to push loads of stuff into the mainstream. There's a lot of people now who are discovering this for the first time. Because yes. um, Kickstarter is great for visibility. It's fantastic for that. Mm -hmm. But it's been, what was it, summer 2016 since our last Kickstarter. Really? Well, we've released a boatload of products since then. Mm -hmm. And we've grown enormously. But we haven't had a chance to really go back to that Kickstarter crowd. So what we've also got then is two pledge levels, which are everything deep dark physically and everything deep dark digitally. And it's oh, basically wow. our back catalogue. So. Mm. If you want to get Thunder of the Thorn on its own, digitally, physically, there's pledge levels for that. If you want to get our complete backlog, digitally or physically, we've got that with Thunder of the Thorn as well. So you can come through and buy everything. They're all nicely discounted, which is all on the Kickstarter. So you can sure. see you know, exactly what you're saving by doing that. But we were like, it's a great opportunity here to say, hey, if you like the look of this, go and check these things out. See if they're of interest to you as well. Right. Because as well as the adventures, we've got a handful of those as well. So there's not just Thunder of the Thorn. We did... Powering Heights, there's four legendary adventures we've done and three standalone right. modules. Mm -hmm. So we've got probably seven or eight adventures now. But yeah. we also did a series um, last year called Beginner Baubles, which is 10 shorter supplements. They're about 30 or so pages each, some just under, some just over, which we liked. We really liked trinkets in the early fifth edition. We really liked the idea of just starting out with something random as a complete wild card. Here's a thing you get and thrust on you at the beginning of the game to separate you, to stop you feeling similar to every other Dwarven Barbarian or, or whatever else you're yeah. creating. But we also like magic items, but they're a bit powerful to give out at first level. So we designed something called Beginner Baubles, which are things where every player gets one of them at the, pre at the outset of the game, randomly determined, and they're like halfway between a trinket and a, and a, and a magic item. 
It's a little okay. bit more powerful, a little bit more interesting, really well received, really popular line for us, but hasn't got that visibility of something like a Kickstarter where it's like, sure. let's just amalgamate them, put them out there, and yeah. people can check them out. And yeah. quite nicely, we're, we're putting those into physical print for the first time as part of the Kickstarter. So a lot of these shorter products were only digital previously. But it's like, you know what, saddle stitching, we finally, we've always done perfect bound books through Drive Through RPG and other platforms. We yeah. actually dived into some of the other print options. And you know what, they're really, really tidy. We're really impressed with the, um, part of the reason we didn't want to put them out was we weren't sure with the shorter product, 20, 30 page book, if it would actually feel good in your hand. Was the print option good? Was the quality there? And we've been quite, quite impressed with what we've seen. Um, yeah. So we're going to put those out as well. I do remember the last time you were on, you had a pretty small library worth of different supplements mm. that you had put yeah. together. So it's, it's good that those are still uh, out there. Yeah, it's grown since then. And the other one we've got as well is a bit more of a, um, a bit more of a gimmicky one for those who are interested is basically just an evening spent with myself and another designer like on Skype or I suppose they live near us, they can come and meet us. But they can spend an evening picking our brains on the product if they want or chatting about music or whatever it is they want to do. Really, for us, it's partly to actually get a chance to meet and talk to people. Sure. Um, so that's always one of the uh, the most rewarding and interesting components of what we do. Uh, I'm hoping that this goes uh, real well for you. It's a very ambitious project. I mean, uh, I think you said it's uh, 100, 128 pages or so <laughs> for Thunder of the Thorn. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's starting at 128, and then if um, we clear certain certain stretch goals, it'll be creeping up a little bit because we've got a we've got to play a primer side. Sure. Um, we've got some materials for because we wanted to make a lot of adventure specific player options, um, and we'd like to get those funded and created. And if we get to the point where we're able to do so, we're going to fold those into the book as well. So okay, it's great. you look at 128 to 160. Um, somewhere yeah. in that spectrum, depending yeah. on what we're able to accomplish. Excellent. But what we're really going to do is that the extra pages are, are all devoted to player options, so classes, backgrounds, stuff yeah. like that. Daniel, uh, if uh, anyone wanted to find more information about like deep dark designs or anything like that, uh, where where could they go? Best two places are following us on Instagram. That's probably where we're most active. Okay. Um, and also, uh, if you go to deep dark dash designs dot uk. Um, you can find us there. And actually, we've got all of our social media links straight there. So it's probably best to start there and mm -hmm. dive into Instagram or wherever else you want from there. Uh, okay. If you specifically want to um, check out our products, we're on Drive Through RPG as Deep Dark Designs. If you look for Deep Dark Designs, you're probably going to find it. It's, <laughs> it's going to be out there. You'll find us or we'll find you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, we'll, no, we will find you. Don't worry. We're like that. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, Alex, if, if uh, folks wanted to find more information about uh, Delve, where could they go? You can find us on Deep Dark Design's website. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll be there. You, you can find us at delvecast.com. We've, we've got a website, too. Yeah, you know. exactly. And if, if you don't find us, we'll find you. We've already found you. We're tracking <laughs> that. We're finding you right this second. I'm sure you're enjoying that. Yeah, everything that we do is over there. Uh, so uh, feel free to go and check that out. Make sure to check out our Patreon because we do have extended interviews over there and some uh, some other materials that you don't normally get uh, with, uh, you know, the, the normal releases. Uh, and thank you to our shiny little patrons, Bonnie Ainsworth and Dominic Perry. Thank you very much uh, for your support. And uh, also make sure to check us out on all of the podcast applications that are out there, the iTunes or Apple Podcasts or whatever they're calling it now. That thing. What are they calling that? Are they, did they decide? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> it's one of those. If, sure. if, you, if, you're, if you're on the, what used to be iTunes, whatever that is, Go to podcasts. You can find us there. You can also find us on Google Play and Spotify and about 16 other things if you're just looking for podcasts. You just type in Delve. It's come, going to come up. Uh, please rate and review and subscribe when you go to any of those. And if you have one specifically that you use, please let us know. Uh, we'd actually appreciate that because we're always trying to figure out like where people hear us. So that's always good. Uh, if you're trying to figure out where you can contact us, uh, one of the best places, we do have an email in the description, so you can always contact us there. Uh, but you can also find us on uh, Twitter. Uh, I am at Citanium. I am at EXP Limited, and the show is at Dell Podcast. Daniel McDonald, thank you for coming on the show. 
uh, and uh, and regaling us with the uh, tales of Thunder of the Thorn. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's it's great, and uh, hoping that everything works out uh, well for you, uh, and we will try to keep uh, up to date on your uh, progress as you go forward. Yes, thank um, you for coming on and explaining all these wonderful things to us and making me want to uh, not have a tree in my dungeon. And especially if it's covered, if the roots are covered in blood, right, Alex? Um, they're covered, especially if it's covered in blood. So we've learned so many lessons on this show. Thank you so much for all of you uh, listening in, and uh, we will see you on the next one. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. Are you? Uh, what? (laughs) (laughs) Are you, Alex? (laughs) Do you want to try that again? (laughs) What the fuck was that? (laughs) I thought I would try it and see what you did. <laughs> okay. I would I would berate you for dumb. <laughs> okay, let's try that again. <laughs>